Let us pray. Gracious God, may your word inspire us to connect with you and to connect with each other. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What words, what words do you think of? What words come to mind when you think about someone being a good negotiator? Tough, hard-nosed, maybe unyielding, cagey, a good bluffer. In the early 1980s, 1981 to be exact, at the very beginning of my business career as a banker, I knew something about myself. I knew I was not comfortable with negotiation, and I knew I had a lot to learn. And my discomfort, it stemmed from what it, it was a result of something I'd always assumed. I'm not sure why, but I always assumed that negotiation was a winner-take-all thing, a winner-take-all proposition, and that hard bargaining was basically the right way to do it. I also assumed you had to be cagey, you had to play your cards very close to your vest, and you certainly didn't want to reveal that, that you wanted what you were negotiating over really badly. You didn't want that. You wanted to pretend like you were ready to walk away from the table at any moment. That's what I assumed. I also assumed that good negotiators, well, likewise, had to be good at bluffing. But as someone who then, and maybe now, I mean, you know, I'm, I cave pretty quickly. I shouldn't admit that. I'm a lousy bluffer, and I certainly do not like conflict. I knew then, and truthfully, I know now, I still had a lot to learn. And so I tried to do something about it. I went out and bought a book, a book that people were talking a lot about at the time. The book I'm sure many know it. It's called Getting to Yes. Getting to Yes. And I remember very clearly my reaction as I was reading this book. I was actually, in a very positive way, I was shocked and surprised. Because the basic idea of the book is that there's a third way, a different way to negotiate. Getting to yes says that you don't have to be engaged in a winner-take-all proposition and that you don't have to necessarily be super cagey or a hard bargainer. While at the same time, it's also saying you don't want to be just sort of giving in and avoid, just to avoid contact, uh, conflict. Instead, the book emphasized a real basic of human communication. Human communication with each other is part of the process. It has emphasized listening and treating each other more as partners, the person you're negotiating with over something, more as partners than adversaries, and aiming for fairness and aiming for solutions which would, if, if this is possible, make leave both sides with some satisfaction, and using reasoning and being open to ideas and not yielding to, or, or I should say, yielding to solid principles and not yielding to hard bargaining and high pressure tactics. Friends, with all of that as background, let me at the outset here say something about God. In my view, God is a very odd negotiator. Very odd. Now, one way to see the Bible, when you step back and look at the Bible, especially the Old Testament, but also into the New Testament, is that the Bible is a series of covenants. The word New Testament, Old Testament, that actually means New Covenant and Old Covenant, and because Testament comes from the Latin word testamentium. Then it's a series, the Bible's like a series of agreements, which were in a sense the result of a series of negotiations between God and the people of God, the various characters, beginning all the way back with Noah and Abraham and Moses. And in 
making all these covenants, negotiating all these covenants, God doesn't seem to be, I don't think you can label God, wow, what a great negotiator, or what a lousy negotiator, or what a hard negotiator, what a soft negotiator. Instead, I think we can say that God at various times is all of the above. And so I'd have to say God is sort of a weird negotiator, very unpredictable. Now you'd think, in, in, in sort of the old school way of thinking about negotiation, you'd think that God, dealing from the ultimate position of strength as the creator of the universe, you'd expect maybe God to just say, do this or else. But that isn't the way it works with God. Instead, with God, well, it's weird because it varies. And I'm, because of that, I'm pretty sure you'd find no case studies on, on how to negotiate in any business schools on God's methods. And so today in Jeremiah, we encounter yet another, as Andrea said, and yet another in this long line, of, long line of covenantal negotiations. It's another, basically what it is, it's a do-over, a redo of old covenants. And Jeremiah calls it the new covenant, but what it really is is a renewal of these old covenants. And here, God shows an unusual way of getting to yes. The Israelite situation, who in effect... God was negotiating with, or Jeremiah on behalf of God was negotiating with, their situation was dire. The Israelites were basically done for. Jerusalem was destroyed, and many of the leading citizens were sent up to, or over to Babylon as slaves, and the prophet Jeremiah was actually one of them. All the result of the Israelites having time and again, they broke their covenant relationship with God and their promise, the covenant, what they broke was their promise to worship only God and to live as God wanted them to live. And Jeremiah, like all the prophets, had warned them time and again that they would be ruined if they didn't turn back to God and to God's ways. As opposed to what they were doing is they'd moved God way down on their list of priorities. And yet today, the great prophet, Jeremiah, completely, he was known as the prophet of doom, and yet today he completely shifts gears to offer up this new covenant, and it is odd. It's not, now, now you've finally done it. I've got you completely where I want you. Now you'll have to do exactly what I tell you to do. No, nope. instead, it's an offer of great hope. And great hope in a terrible time. And it's a promise of forgiveness, of eternal forgiveness. And it's also the promise of God to be in there with us, helping us by putting these laws, the Torah, on, in their hearts, in their hearts, so that they wouldn't forget, so they know it by heart. As Christians, we might call this the promise of God's Holy Spirit helping us in our hearts, or we might say it's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So when you look across all of the negotiations, all of the covenants, in the Bible. All the agreements, all the negotiations, one thing that's missing from God's part, God is not cagey. It's like God. It's like God is the one who is, and I, I, well, I mean, honestly, it feels like God is the one who's desperate for the deal. Constantly, God is constantly pursuing the Israelites and us. Time after time, God comes back with new covenants or restarting or restating old covenants saying, please don't forget that we promised to be loyal to each other. 
God, the creator of the universe, the Lord Almighty, just keeps coming back to the table. No bluffing. Yes, punishment. Yes, God's demanding. But God always comes back to the table. God's always pursuing us. Seemingly, I'll probably get in trouble with this, but seemingly desperate to get to yes. To get us. Desperate for us to say yes. So eager, so eager to make a deal with us that God was basically willing to give up the shop. Basically saying, I promise to forgive you now and forever. In fact, I'll go even further. I'll put my own son up on a cross so that you'll know, so that you will know in your heart that I'm always ready to forgive you. I want you to say yes. Please, my children, say yes. I think a good question as we come almost through Lent, we're almost through with Lent. Next Sunday is the last Sunday of Lent. I think a good question for us to ask is this. What does it mean? What does it mean for your life to say yes to God? something amazing about the way God approaches this. The way God's reaching out and trying to strike a deal with us. God's outstretched hands, constantly outstretched hands, trying to get us to say yes. Is that God gives us the decision. Gives us the decision whether to reach back, whether to say yes. But also, God gives us the decision as to how we want to say yes. What yes will look like in our lives. And while Jesus, of course, has a lot to say about what that should look like in our lives, and the obvious hint is that you can be certain of one thing, almost always it has to do with love or forgiveness. But rather than getting into the details, maybe as we're getting close to Easter, maybe it's best to simply let the question stand in each of our hearts. What does it mean for you or for any of us? What does it mean in our lives today or tomorrow or beyond? What does it mean for us to say yes to God? Amen.